the first things I'm going to do is talk about this strange conveyor belt process that happens with privacy um, and with civil liberties and especially with access to data that happens when a party is in opposition and then what happens when the party gets into government. The danger of how we lose public trust on that, what we lose and what we gain. Um, and I'll do it with two examples. And they're examples of the political parties that are in power now, one north of the border in Scotland, the other uh, down here in Westminster with the Tories. So just look at the SNP. The SNP had a very proud record, really, on privacy issues, um, stood up very strongly against Labour on ID cards when they were in opposition. Even when they came into power, they weren't that bad, really. I mean, 2010, they brought in some data protection guys. They followed most of the things that they were told on signifiers and you know, trying to disentangle data from the person to which it belongs in order that you can use that information more wisely, but also in a way that respects people's privacy. They signed up to it in 2010. They renewed it in 2014. What are they doing now? Now, they seem to have got themselves in a position where smuggled into a consultation document, they're going to take your NHS number, which is a number which rather interestingly and symbolically actually came from ID cards after the war. It's moved us across the UK. It's there with date of birth. Um, no medical information there, to be fair, unless you suffer from cancer, unless you've been involved in tests that you've signed up to. But nevertheless, quite a degree of information about where you live, who your GP is. They're going to take that information and make it, uh, connect it to an entitlement card, which you will use as you go to the leisure centre, when you use the swimming pool, when you go to the library, which you might use for proof of age, which later on looks like it might be entitlement to use public transport, which might keep data of the transport journeys that you have made. They're going to take all of that information, all connected up, basically a de facto ID card in all but name, and in fact it will soon be called that once the campaign has caught on to this, and they're going to open it up to any public body to use. So, I mean, the water regulator would, for instance, have access to where you've been going, what books you've taken out of the library, and eventually, quite realistically, um, as to what, for instance, information about your taxes are. So we've seen this extraordinary twist for the SNP to go down that road, as controversial as what I've just mentioned is, they didn't see the need to put it into primary legislation. Instead, they used something called a statutory instrument. Now, if I get given half the chance, I really enjoy ranting and raving about the disaster that are statutory instruments and how often these things get used. And it's one of the reasons why no one invites me to dinner parties. Statutory instruments mean that you don't have to have a debate in Parliament. You barely have to have any debate at all. You just pass this thing, nobody knows, and suddenly something changes. Usually, when you have centralization of information, that stuff takes place very often through statutory instruments. No one's really aware that it's happening. The Tories, again, had a, I mean, you know, they, they sort of danced around it a little bit, but they had a pretty good time, you know, opposing Labour on ID cards. Pretty good uh, fighting some of the, the more sort of agrarious and disastrous suggestions of new Labour, for instance, the abolition of habeas corpus. In power, They've slowly changed, much like the SNP did. I mean, the first couple of years, there was an awful lot of talk of civil liberties. I mean, admittedly, Theresa May looked like a sort of a human puppet as she was being forced to say the civil liberties stuff by the Lib Dems. But nevertheless, you know, out it came. And then, of course, the Supers Charter comes in. I mean, they've been hammering away at the Snoopers Charter. You can't have a terror attack or any other security story without the Tories saying that it justifies the use of the Snoopers Charter. So two things that are going on in that bill, or that we presume will be going on in that bill will be the access to browsing history, which will be connected to IP, to your IP address. And secondly, what was the second thing that I was going to talk about? Oh, yes, third party data um, from, say, Skype or Facebook or, or Twitter. Um, Anderson, the independent reviewer of terrorism laws, came out with his report on this quite recently. It was, I think it was about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And he said, look, there is no argument for the third party data at the moment. They have been failed to demonstrate the need for these places to collect this data, for it to be tagged to the person that uses it. They need a very strong operational argument before they can make the case for browsing data. Now, browsing data only goes up to the first slash, but nevertheless, when you start thinking of the other kind of information that might be available to the state about you as an individual, for instance, what the SNP wants to collect about your travel movements, about your GP, and start connecting that to your browsing data, you actually get a very firm grasp of who a person might be, and rather more than we might be comfortable with the state having, certainly before the state has decided it is bothered to have a debate with us or one in Parliament. Um, nevertheless, the Tories will press on with this. So what do we learn about this sort of strange process by which parties are quite critical of this when they're in opposition to the way that they behave once they're in government? I think there's three things that explain the situation. The first one is that there is an incentive on private firms 
for states to adopt this kind of policy. So if you're an IT contractor, you don't get any money if the Home Office employs more coppers. You don't get any more money if the MOD you know, hires a few more spooks. Or, but you do get money if you sell them some IT solution for 50 million quid. You get money, 2 million quid, just for servicing it every single year. So you go in, you talk to ministers who generally, you know, are frankly not the smartest people in the world. And you convince them with lots of lovely talk of big data and how useful this is and how much money they will save by spending the 50 million with you that they would otherwise have spent on, you know, spies or something. And, you know, ministers usually fall for it. Civil servants, who are usually considerably smarter, will often fall for it, especially if you take them to a restaurant and pour wine down their throat, which is a very old journalistic technique, which lobbyists have also picked up. And you'll often find that these projects pass. Um, the second, I think, factor in it is, follows from actually quite good intentions by the state, which is that it feels that it can solve problems. You take something dreadful happens like baby pee dreadful situation a few years ago with the child. And you think, well, we want to fix this. So maybe there's data that's available as to the kind of scenarios in which we might red flag something where we could, that could trigger an intervention by state agents to go in there. They want to very often do good. Um, and that desire to connect all these units of information happen to be people. And information about them and actually to interject in it is very strong in the state. It also has slightly more cynical perspectives that can help you, you know, on negative Sort of negative coverage in the press. Um, the third thing that I think explains it, again, I've forgotten. Yeah, it's a psychological thing that happens, I think, with the assessment of risk. That's the, and this is especially in security matters. That when your job is to look forwards and think of potential risks, typically the human brain overestimates them. It happens simply because we don't know what they are yet. And then when you look back, you think, well, perhaps we did. I mean, you take, we've just had the 10th anniversary of 7-7. In those 10 years, one person has been killed in Britain by Islamic terrorism, Lee Rigby. That's a pretty good record and certainly doesn't match up to the way that we assessed risk during those 10 years as we talked about what would happen in the future. So there's also a psychological dispensation when you're tasked with protecting people in the country towards over-assessing risk and towards, therefore, setting up too many protections for it or potentially too many protections for it. Um, now, I would suggest that when we go down that road, it's a terrible mistake when we don't take the public with us. We lose a lot when we don't take the public with us. We lose the ability to make good use of data. And that can happen quite simply. It happens by making sure the data is anonymous, by making sure that there's a public and a parliamentary debate about it, and by making sure that we have sensible watchdogs, not like the Intelligence and Security Committee, which meets behind doors and clearly has no teeth to speak of whatsoever, but something perhaps with judicial oversight that might take a step, might look at each process. So right now, we know, for instance, you think of the genetic information available to the NHS, you think of the socioeconomic information available to the Office of National Statistics. Maybe if we have that information properly anonymised, we could start saying things like, well, you know, why is there more diabetes in this part of Liverpool? Or, you know, maybe Asian women are more likely to suffer from this. And we know that Asian women go to this sort of place. Maybe this is a place to target advertising so that we can bring them in for these kind of tests. All of that is doable and would be very, very helpful. But it relies on having public trust. And public trust is lost very, very quickly in this area. On ID cards after 2000, um, September the 11th, there was 90% support for ID cards. That was lost instantly when it was shown that the government was overstepping the mark, when it was going beyond what people were comfortable with, when it wasn't engaging in a proper debate with people. So the surreptitious means of government, I think, is very dangerous. It loses support for stuff that could actually save lives and make the world a slightly better place. It's a very regrettable process, but one that seems to be absolutely part and parcel of what happens to human beings and political parties when they come into power. Thank you very much.